welcome to Talk of the Neighborhoods. I'm Joe Heisler, your host, coming to you from the BNN Live Studios, Eggleston Square, Jamaica Plain. We're tonight on the Boston Neighborhood Network, where we have a terrific show. None other than the new mayor, the next mayor, Mayor-elect Marty Walsh joins us to talk about his hopes, his dreams, his plans for the new administration when he gets signed in in the uh, early in January. Then on the second half, as we've witnessed a new star rising in the east, uh, who better to chronicle the fortunes of Dorchester than the managing editor of the Dorchester Reporter, Bill Forey, joins us to talk about uh, the new center of the political universe here in Boston, Dorchester. All that and more tonight on Talk in the Neighborhoods. Talk in the Neighborhoods, I'm Joe Heisler, your host. Tonight, a two-part show, but all politics, as is our usual want. And tonight, a, a couple of very fine guests, and uh, none better than my first guest tonight. He, of course, is the mayor-elect of the city of Boston. And come January, he will become mayor of the city of Boston. None other than uh, Marty Walsh joins us tonight. Marty, nice Thanks, to Joe. Thanks, Thanks for having so me. For, it's nice uh, to be here. Oh, uh, First of all, congratulations uh, you. on your campaign victory. Uh, it was a great campaign. Uh, you know, I think uh, your organization uh, it was uh, uh, peaked at just the right time. Yeah, it seemed like it. It felt like it. Yeah, it was good. Well, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, have you? It's been now almost a month, or yep. a little better than a month. Yep. Uh, you, uh, you. Uh, you feeling? Uh, you still wanting to pinch yourself in the morning? Uh, you. Uh, no, it's changed a little. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about taking over in about a month from today, I think it is. Um, but we're going to be, uh, we're still, we're doing the transition now and we're working. I was with the mayor today. We did a, a simulated snow emergency uh, about how, how it would start from the beginning through a whole snowstorm. And uh, his team was there. It was a good day. And, you know, as, as far as being mayor, you know, it, it's about making sure the streets are plowed uh, in the winter Number time, one. you know, and make sure they're clean in the, in the summertime. And we're going to work on all that. But today was a good day for us. And He's been very good. We've talked about a lot of different issues. Yeah. Well, I and we're seeing, of course, uh, you, you uh, the night before Christmas at the uh, Boston yeah, the Pops. That was intimidating. Uh, that was uh, tough. Uh, that was intimidating. Uh, you know, some Christmas tree lightings. Yep. Uh, uh, but, but but is it really kind of uh, uh, sinking in? Because, uh, you know, it's such a hard campaign and yeah. long it's, and arduous. It's fast-paced now. It's a different fast pace. There's a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, uh, you know, some decisions that are going to be made soon uh, regarding different positions mm -hmm. in, the, in the fifth floor and then over time about department heads and things like that and what the cabinet's going to look like. Uh, you know, I've been sitting down with current staff mm -hmm. and city employees and talking about what their plans are and uh, everyone's been very helpful and it's, you know, a lot of decisions have to be made and I'm taking, you know, my time in the sense of making sure we put this thing together right. Uh, you know, Mayor Menino, uh, 20 years ago when he, when he took over, you know, he kind of inherited an organization. Mm -hmm. Um, and he made changes over time. I think, you know, in order to move Boston forward properly, uh, we're going to take time. I might say take time, take a, a month or two to, to work through things, and, and we'll make the changes we need. Well, and I want to talk some more about that. But I, I, first, I, I got to go back to the campaign and, and that uh -huh. night. Uh, I mean, or when did you know? When did you really uh, know that you, you had it in hand? I didn't and, uh, really. Did I mean, you... it was hard. I mean, it was a, it was a tough day. Uh, you know, uh, John John did a great job in, in election day. You know, his people were polling, we were polling. Um, around 3.30 that afternoon, I got a little nervous. The numbers weren't the way I needed them to be. And the whole campaign, I pretty much stayed out of the field. And, and at 3.30 that afternoon, I got on the phone and made a few calls and suggested a few adjustments which were made. And uh, that night, um, probably about 8 8.15, 8.20, where the numbers were starting to come in, and, and at one point it was down to 13 precincts left, and, and, and uh, we were up by about 2,100 votes, and one of those precincts, I kept asking, is it 13.10, is it 13.10, is it which is my home precinct, okay. and I found out that wasn't in yet, so I felt good because I knew there'd be a little bit of a cushion there. Sure. Uh, and then around, around, I think it was around quarter or nine, uh, we, we, we got the word we had won, and then I spoke to John, uh, John Conley a little later that night. Uh, you know, it was a good conversation. Um, John's a friend, and you know, it's a tough conversation in a way because you know, I've, I've, I, I was, was, say, I was with know? him in the beginning when he started to run, and, and you know, we're friends. And we're going to continue to be friends. I haven't spoken to him since that night, but you know, giving him his time. Um, but you know, he ran a great campaign. Actually, all 
Most of us did. I mean, there was 12 people in the race in the beginning, and, and there was a lot of great conversation that came out about this. And I don't think Boston certainly didn't get shortchanged on this man's race. I mean, no, I, I don't. I don't think anybody felt that way. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, you know, it was a great field. It was a great and, field. And uh, I, you know, it was uh, all things being equal, it was uh, came down to. You know, a lot of the things that uh, used to count a lot, uh, shoe leather and yep. uh, getting out the vote. But, I mean, even though, I, I guess no one should have been surprised. I mean, you finished first in the prelim. Yep. Uh, but uh, you know, I think a lot of people uh, kind of might have underestimated you a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think, uh, I, was, I, know, think I was uh, underestimated the whole time. I, I think, you know, from the primary, uh, you know, when, when I got into the race, I, I clearly saw a pathway to victory. And, um, you know, and I worked hard, and, and my organization worked hard. and. Uh, we continued that after the primary, and I, st I still think people counted us out the whole time, which in a way is a good thing to do happen because when people don't think you can win, they might not pay as much attention to you. And I don't mean the candidates. I'm talking about right. other people. And um, But I, I just... Little, maybe a little less negativity. Yeah, I mean, I felt pre pretty positive. And, you know, we had a... For the most part, I feel the campaign... I, I don't think I would have changed anything, per se, in my campaign. I think the press, um, to some degree, the, the print media was a little bit difficult at certain times, mm -hmm. but they clearly, they covered it differently after the final, after the primary. They really got into the issues, which I, which I was appreciative of, and, you know, we were able to articulate through the press a little bit uh, what, what, our, what our goal was mm -hmm. and what, what we were going to try and do. Uh, so I think they did a lot better job in the second half. Plus, I don't think they knew how to cover it in the first part. Wow. There was 12 people running. How do you... How do you figure out who to cover, what to go to, well, and they just don't have the resources? Well, so much, and it's not like years past when there were a lot more uh, uh, media resources. Well, there's more uh, social media, but social, well, social media is different. But, yeah. but the, the print, they don't have the, the reporters and yeah. the, to cover. Not that they want to. Yeah. Well, you, you you got done with the campaign. You finally. Uh, got a little R and R yeah, with your nice. uh, significant other yeah, there. Yeah, we, uh, we went away. It was nice. You know, I, everybody's wondering. Did you did you think about popping the question? We we, we thought about sleeping and, <laughs> and resting, and uh, you know, I ate three times a day and, and tried to put on some of the twenty five pounds I lost yeah, in the in true. the campaign. Uh, we had a great time. Uh, you know, I, I left the, the cell phone was there, but I didn't really use it. Uh, use the yes. iPad a little bit and uh, you just rested. You needed that downtime. I was exhausted. The last 10 days of the campaign, I think, you know, you could see it in John too. Uh, we were both just exhausted, you know, like two, he out. two heavyweight fighters and we're just exhausted <laughs> about it. Slugging out. Well, of course, uh, you know, now you're back. You, you said, you know, the transition's uh, in progress. And of course, uh, uh, to those, what's that old saying? To those to whom much is given, much is expected. Yep. We, we, last uh, week we had on uh, um, uh, Reverend uh, Mignard uh, Culpepper yep. from the Boston uh, Inclusion Alliance. Yep. And, uh, um, and of course, he was very uh, uh, appreciative of, of uh, your campaign and, yep. and what you said, but uh, they're looking to hold your feet to the fire now. And uh, I, I got to assume they're not the only ones. Uh, uh, you've got you're getting a lot of new friends as well. I'm yeah. sure. How how are you dealing with that, and how I mean, will you deal with that? Because at least uh, you know around the uh, issues of race and uh, people of color, yeah. you've, you've made some pretty broad promises. Yeah, and we, we've kept them. I mean, we, we our transition team alone. When you, when you talk about it, I think our transition team right now, the numbers are probably uh, we have about 240 something members of the committee. Uh, right. I think we're at 49.5 percent people of color on, on the committee. If, you, if you're keeping percentages, and about the same for women. Uh, so we really, really focused on making sure that those transition teams are inclusive uh, through all kinds of different, you know, uh, ethnic lines and, and 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 economic lines and educational lines. And so we we put together, I think, a very good transition team. Uh, a lot of people are giving me compliments on it mm -hmm. today. Even the business, as at a business community. Uh, luncheon this afternoon, not a luncheon, I went and spoke to the board, and they were very complimentary of the transition team, so it's good to see that. I, I mean, I think, you know, when I say I made promises in the campaign, I did, but they're not promises, they were talking, stating the facts, you know, w facts, and we're going to go out and make sure that we have a, a very inclusive uh, city hall, and we're also going to make sure that as I'm out there, we're going to be making sure we, the promises I mentioned in neighborhoods bringing economic development and opportunities, I'm going to work on those really hard to make sure that happens. Well, yeah, and you mentioned the transition team and that you've uh, put together, and it, you know, it's, it covers a lot of ground there. Are you happy with the progress they're making? Uh, there was some suggestion, and we talked to, at the top of the show a little bit about uh, uh, people uh, wondering when you were going to start making uh, 
uh, some appointments. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, there was a piece in the Globe that said, well, uh, you know, uh, Bill de Blasio just uh, announced yeah. his police commissioner and et cetera, et cetera, yeah. and, and others uh, said he's in that have been, but uh, I'm very you, happy. You, you, I'm very happy, happy with the progress. Yeah, I'm, I'm. You know, I think the the paper is always looking for that next story, and and you know, I'm not going to govern by the paper. I'm going to govern by the best way for the people of the city of Boston. And you know, our transition team is out in the neighborhoods. We had a, a meeting tonight. Actually, been several meetings, but one of them, uh, there was 220 people from the public showed up. And this weekend, this Saturday, over at the uh, Reggie Lewis Track Center, we're going to have a a big community forum. Actually, Roxbury Community College. Uh, we're going to have a big community forum. And uh, we're going to be talking about transition and talking about mm -hmm. people to come out and talk about different uh, ideas they might have. And uh, anyone's welcome. To anyone's welcome, and it's going to be an all-day affair. I think I believe it starts at nine o'clock in the morning, and uh, we're, we're, it's going to be out there and put it through all the newspapers and social media and things like that. If you go on MightyWalsh.org, it's, it's going to be on there as well. And it's really about opening up and having people uh, come in and, and share their ideas and what they want to see out mm -hmm. of their government and. And talk about some some situations. Then we're going to have workout groups. We have a, the Rappaport Institute is helping us put this on. And they, they, we have facilitators, and we have a whole bunch of folks out there. Well, sometimes in some places, when you have a transition, uh, uh, there's a you know clean sweep. People are yep. swept out. New people are brought in. Uh, uh, are we going to see uh, a lot of new faces? Will there be some uh, uh, Menino administration uh, uh, appointments carried over? Yeah, there'll be a little bit of both. I think we're going to see both. I mean, we have some there's some very talented people that work for the city um, that, that I'd like to s hopefully they'll stay. Uh, there's some other people that I think people leaving on their own. Uh, there's some changes coming mm -hmm. uh, as well, people leaving on their own. And there'll be some other folks that won't be in the administration. Uh, maybe not January 6th, they might be there, but they won't be there too far after. And, you know, we're evaluating each department and, see, and assessing it. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in getting rid of people for the sake of getting rid of them. I think if, if they're doing a good job and, and they're committed to the city and, and they love mm -hmm. the city as much as I do, uh, they're, they're more than welcome. They'll have an opportunity to stay. Well, of course, uh, you know, the, uh, there's been so much focus in recent years, and maybe it's, it's not the, uh, uh, the right uh, amount of time, but uh, so much is put on the first hundred days oh, yeah. or what you hope to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, what does uh, Marty Walsh hope to accomplish in the first hundred we're, days? We're going to talk about that at the, uh, the swearing in once that's all set. Uh, we're going to un un unroll roll out what we're going to be talking about, what we'd like to accomplish. Uh, we're actually right now in, the, in, the, in the, these working groups that are figuring out what's going on in these departments to see what we can really kind of address short term and what the long term solutions are. And, we're going to be announcing at some point what we want to accomplish in the first hundred days, and then it's really going to be after that. You know, I think the the real benchmark for a new mayor after 20 years is probably uh, realistically the first six months. I mean, I think that's really kind of that's fair to what, say. What what can you really accomplish? Mm -hmm. uh, but the first hundred days are important to kind of set the bar and be aggressive. I, I'm not. I don't want to change things just for the sake of changing things. I mean, I, th I don't think that's a mm -hmm. that's a way to run a city. I think what we have to do is, is make some changes that are going to be real changes that people can actually feel you know, around licensing and maybe more online and things like that we can do initially. Um, you know, and then, you know, when it comes to the snow, I mean, you know, making sure that that first snowstorm that is going to be under my watch, that we're prepared for it so that the people don't miss a beat. Well, uh, of course, uh, and you, d you mentioned that you talked to a business group today. I think uh, many people feel that uh, one of the most uh, ambitious things you talked about during the campaign was uh, restructuring the BRA yeah. into a... Uh, a new economic development yep. agency, and uh, uh, is that something that uh, will happen? In your not in mind the first hundred days, yeah. but I think what's going to happen there is we're going to look and see what's working now, what's not working there, uh, make some adjustments, and there'll be probably some some bigger mm -hmm. changes as, as we move forward. Uh, what I'm not going to do is stop development in the city of Boston. I'm going to make sure that in in January, when there's a BRA meeting, that the meeting is hosted, and if there things ready to go, we're going to move them on down the road. But I think what we're going to do too, part of this listening tour, is really to kind of hear from neighborhoods. And the BRA will, will probably be one of those areas. It depends on the neighborhood. I mean, when, when you're in certain parts of the city, uh, you have bigger concerns about the BRA than others. In other parts of the city, they're concerned about 
crime and some other parts of the city they're concerned about education right. and making sure there's good schools and parks so we're really you know again we're going to be putting these things in place as we move well I, I don't know and I, I'm there's a little tongue-in-cheek here that there'll be too many projects left to consider there's been a, a, lot, a number of them that have kind of come uh, through I'll and I'll break uh, the ground on them and cut the <laughs> ribbon and it's over four years from now they're mine right <laughs> um, how has Mayor Menino been about this uh, whole been actually, trend uh, process? Now, uh, you know, not that uh, uh, you weren't on, on uh, speaking terms with him, but, uh, you know, he didn't endorse you during the campaign, yep. did, of course, didn't endorse anybody. Uh, uh, has he been helpful? He's been very helpful. I mean, today, uh, every day, we talk, um, we, we see each other or talk almost every day. Um, his, his, you know, his information that he's been giving me has been great. Some of his advice... Um, you know about how to handle the job. Uh, he gave me some advice on how to handle my family, meaning you know that they're also a life change for them as well. And, and you know having to make sure you make yeah. some time for them. And I want to do that. I want to make sure my, I don't. You know I can't leave my family behind because uh, at because you're working a hundred hours you know, a week. You know, there are times. <laughs> I mean, you ha when, when when something happens, your family's there for you. So you need to make sure yeah. you're there for your family. So he gave me some great advice on that. But no, he's been very helpful. You know. Uh, very early, we had a meeting the first day after I got elected, and, and then that Friday he had a business meeting with the business leaders in Boston, and then I met with him a couple of times privately. He's been very, very good, and you know today I met with him again about the the, the uh, snow and ice and, and plowing, and then afterwards he gave me some other advice. So he's been very good with that, and I, I'm appreciative of it. Well, we're all thinking of uh, Ray Flynn uh, riding the snow plows. Will Marty Walsh yeah. be riding the snow plows? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. I was shoveling today. I'll tell you that. <laughs> like so everyone life else. Life didn't change. Well, of course, so one of the things you won't have to deal with is uh, uh, whether there will be a new uh, uh, Boston Police Patrolman Union contract. Yeah, the uh, the uh, yeah. uh, city council this past week voted yeah. uh, 12 to nothing to uh, uh, approve the arbitration yeah. awarded. Uh, is that a little bit of a relief to you after you know being kind of bludgeoned as uh, being the union guy all this? Well, I mean, uh, not to have that kind of hanging over you as you. It's, uh, it's clearly going to give me a fresh start on on the next contract yeah. that's going to be negotiated. So I have that opportunity now to, to negotiate that contract, uh, the next one. But you know, it, it's one of those things that it's 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 a it's it's a larger award. Uh, it went four, the police went four and a half years without mm -hmm. a contract. Uh, they had probably had one of the toughest years that they've ever had, you know, as far as the marathon and, and things like that. Actually, a police officer was shot on Saturday. Right. So, I mean, they, the job the police officers have is very difficult. And, you know, hopefully now we'll be able to have this communication line open and we can talk about, you know, wh what's next as far as the contracts go. And, and not just the police, but all the unions in the mm -hmm. city. Uh, you know, and we're going to deal with it. We're going to fund it and, and we'll figure it out. There's still three other units of the police that have to be negotiated. Uh, the superior was a sizable uh, award. Are you concerned though that it, it will affect your ability well, to uh, you know do some of the other things that you want to have well, to have the revenue uh, the the estimated cost and I don't know if that's accurate is you know like eighty seven million dollars, which is uh, uh, some of know. that money was set aside. Yeah. and I think that that you know again as as the as the mayor of the city of Boston, we'll, we'll have to deal with mm -hmm. that when it comes to the budget. Part of it's going to go back into you know what kind of economic development can we bring to the city of Boston to really, you know, continue our tax increase, our tax increases here in the city for we get more money um, into the budget, uh, and we're going to continue to work on that. Uh, and, and you know, uh, the council voted 12 nothing. It was a unanimous vote. So I mean, clearly, this the case that was made by the arbiter was was a good one. Uh, I wasn't down there that day for it, uh, but I'm you know again I'm looking forward to the next contract that's coming out so we can start to to talk about it. And and have. Have we cleared the air of this, uh, for instance, talking with the business group today, of course, and, you know, some of it was, uh, you know, fairly harsh uh, uh, towards you during the campaign that somehow you, you couldn't be fair when it came, comes to uh, unions. And we talked about yeah. this before. Yeah. And, and uh, but uh, is that kind of taken that... Uh, monkey off your back, I mean, so uh, to speak, or when I'm talking, when I'm talking in front of the business groups, and I've only I've done a few. Um, you know, I let them know I'm open and fair, and when I talk in front of labor, labor knows the same. Um, you know, I've always been that way as a, as a legislator, and then when I took over the building trades, so um, I think people are, are less concerned about. It. I think it was, you know, there was a lot of hype about it. Uh, I thought it was, you know, I didn't think it was needed all that hype, but uh, clearly, a, a, as a mayor, you have to look at, you know, all the residents of the city of Boston. You know, and I'm proud. I'm proud that where I came from. I'm certainly proud that I came uh, out of the, out of the labor industry, labor field, if you will, or as, as a union laborer. I'm proud of that. I'm very proud of that. Um, 
yesterday was my first, last meeting as the president of Local 223. I had to step down as president. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a hard day because I grew up in that. And I'm still a member. Um, but, you know, as mayor of the city of Boston, I have to make sure all everyone's interests are at, best at hand. And I'm gonna, I will do that. Feel some pressure, though, to uh, maybe be a little tougher uh, in uh, labor negotiations, union negotiations? If I have to, I will be. I mean, I think there's times where I'll have to be, and there's times that I might not have to be. I, th I think that, you know, what, we, what I spoke about in the campaign is transparency, openness, and, and mutual respect. Mm -hmm. We're going to do that. And I think that, you know, I've had some initial discussions with, with some of my friends in organized labor now. And I, I think the problem is a lot of times cities and towns, and not just Boston, but they view labor and, and, and management. I don't view it that way. I view it as a partnership. You know, if the city is not doing well and there has to be layoffs or problems, then, you know, the, the, the labor force hurts with that as well. And I think the, it should be the other way around. So I think we have to view it more of a partnership than an us for a stem. And it really hasn't been done that way, I think, uh, in the more, most recent No, past. but it can be. You, there's, there's plenty of companies out there that, that have done very successful things. Uh, you know, Ford Motor Company uh, sat down with the unions and, the, the, you know, the UAW, and they made a lot of changes. And, and the company is, is one of the best companies in the world now. So sometimes by having that negoti that sit down and that conversation, uh, you can certainly have labor management strong relationships because it's about moving, advancing a business, and in this case, the city forward. Well, you know, you've got, uh, as you mentioned, uh, less now less than a month until you're uh, sworn in, uh, and uh, it's going to be a huge celebration. Uh, I, I don't think. know it's going to be huge. Yeah. It's going to be a celebration. I don't know it's going to be huge. <laughs> if you read the paper, it's going to be huge. I, I'm really not. <laughs> well, what about that? You now, will, will there be an inaugural ball, though? Will there There'll be, be some a... type of event. We're going to announce something this week, uh, a couple of events. We're going to do a different couple of components to, to this. Uh, you know, the paper made it sound like, you know, it's the first time this has ever happened. Uh, this is a story that happens uh, every either uh, two or four years, depending on who gets elected, uh, governor or mayor. And it's something that, you know, it's going to be open for the city. And hopefully, you know, a lot of people in the city want to partake in some of the festivities we want to do and the events we want to do. But, you know, I, I'm looking forward to less so the inauguration and more so getting getting to the job. I mean, Rolling up your sleeves. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, now, you, it, to, to do this, though, and correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, you had to go out and, you know, keep raising money or raise yeah, money yeah, for, yeah, uh, for the uh, And, uh, of course, it's not the first, won't be the last, but no. uh, uh, feel funny to all of a sudden turn around and reach, have to reach out. You thought you were done fundraising for no, a while. No, I mean, I mean, actually, it's, it's a little less reaching out. A lot of people are offering to help and support. Yep. I mean, even the transition team, we have to raise some money for the transition team because it, it takes staff and it takes people to do things. Um, so I'm looking, you know, th that's difficult too. But people have been very helpful in, in offering support here uh, with, with the inauguration. And, you know, it's part of, it, you know, you're talking about it's the first time in 20, I mean, the mayor's had inaugural balls right. in his other, re his four other reelections. Yeah. But it's the first time in 20 years there's a new mayor coming to Boston. And, and you know, in, in New York, it's the first time in 12 years and other places, you know, Chicago just went through it a few years ago right. with Rahm Emanuel. So I think you know I think it's exciting, and we're gonna we're gonna do something special here in Boston. So people, you know, it's not just an inaugural, whatever we're gonna call it, celebration ball. Uh, it's gonna be a lot more to it. Well, of course, uh, yeah, and with your election, you've uh, you know. You've always had a lot of friends, but you're getting a lot of new yeah, friends. I have, I have uh, new friends. How are you kind of dealing with that? And uh, well, right now, all that, the, that everybody, everybody's coming with reaching the hand out. I, I saw something in the paper, and again, I don't know if it's correct that you know you've already uh, uh, the committee's already received something like you know over a thousand resumes and. Uh, you know, people looking for work, and yep. a lot of people. Uh, oh yeah, how are you? Well, I mean, with pe this? people uh, are sending the resumes in. Some of it's for transition, some of it's for jobs, yeah. and you know, people. You know, we're not at that point yet. We, we we took the resumes for the transition. As far as the jobs, you know, we're a long way away from from actually seeing a process here. Uh, but people, I think, what people might not understand, there's not a, a turnover. Like the federal government, when when there's a new president, I think they say 55 55,000 new jobs turn over the first year or something like that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen here, you know. And, and I'm, I'm looking at it's not. It's not like you have this whole influx of right. new opportunities. Um, it's, but, but people clearly see this new mayor and they want to be part of it. Sure. Part of something. Uh, I don't know. Probably don't know all the thousand people. I think people just <laughs> randomly send them in. And, but you know, the economy still hasn't turned around. People are looking for work, and they're probably yeah, saying this is a great opportunity for me to try and, and land something as far as a, a job. And, and they see maybe a new mayor, and they, they think you know maybe there's going to be a lot more opportunity. Well, you've got, we've got just a couple minutes with you. What, what do you see as the, uh, the 
looking forward, and again, you know, you're you know, kind of focused on the immediate here, but yeah. the, what's going to be your biggest challenges coming up? What about the uh, schools? The, the, the schools? Schools. School, schools are, are going to be a challenge just to make sure that, you know, some of the gains that have been made in mm -hmm. Boston over the last couple of years, that we can expand that. Uh, I think it's very important. I think, you know, we spoke in the campaign about having uh, early childhood education as a, as a priority of ours and how do you pay for that. So I think schools is one of those things that, you know, it's about the future of Boston as well. And I think, you know, we're, we're going to be working towards a superintendent search at some point here in the future, in the near future. Uh, I have the, appoint, the ability to appoint two new school committee members, mm -hmm. which we're working on now. Uh, and, and it's about how do we make sure that we continue the advances in schools. You know, we lost two schools to take over by the state this year. Uh, you know, I'm going to work to make sure we get those schools back and, and how do we improve the education. We also have issues around school buildings and how do we, you know, promote and build new school buildings and work, you know, with the state and how, how do we pay for them. So I think that's, that's one of the number one issues f f from the early days of my administration to get the search moving and, and, and start to continue moving our system forward. Did I see in the uh, the uh, paper that you uh, said something in the effect you, you would consider hiring John Connolly as a superintendent? That was, that was, um, that was um, uh, another TV show that asked me and, you know, kind of half-assed it. And I said, well, of course, if John's interested, it kind of took off. <laughs> um, but I, I don't think John would be interested in yeah. being in the superintendent of the school. That John's going to do great things um, in his life. He's, you know, he'll, he'll go and do great things. He'll do just fine. Well, you know, one of the issues that, that won't go away, and I'm not sure when it will be uh, decided, but uh, is now, of course, the whole issue of... Uh, uh, casino yeah. and uh, the the latest uh, proposal is to uh, uh, move the Suffolk Downs uh, yeah, over to Revere. proposal to Revere. Uh, what's what does that do for Boston and and uh, is that something you would oppose or how are you going to deal with it? Well, tomorrow the the uh, gaming commission is going to be ruling if if Revere can be a host community. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the next question will be if they, if they vote in favor of Avia, then we have to begin the process of, of deciding if we're a surrounding community, uh, which we will be a surrounding community. And uh, I think there's two ways of looking at it. Some people in East Boston, the vote went down in East Boston. People clearly don't want right. a casino. As mayor of the city of Boston, I have to make sure I ensure that the people of East Boston are protected, or Charlestown, for that matter. Right. Uh, and part of that is there's two, two ways of thinking about it. Do you in, not enter into an agreement around, about a surrounding community, or do you just fight it? And I think that in, in, for the right things for, for the people of East Boston and, and, and Charlestown, they have to look at at least negotiating a surrounding community agreement. Now, we might choose to fight it uh, event ultimately, uh, but I think that we, we have to see what happens tomorrow. Tomorrow is another step uh, in this. Right. I, th I think that nobody really expected or thought that once that vote went down East Boston, that Suffolk Downs would, would, would keep continue moving right. forward. I certainly didn't. Uh, I was a little surprised by that. Uh, but they decided to, so we'll have to see what happens tomorrow, and then we'll have to make decisions. With the idea being that uh, some mitigation Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the, funding, the, the yeah. impact is, is big on Boston. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, East Boston, it's literally, I mean, the impact is as big. If you build it in Revere, it's as big as it was as it built in East Boston. I mean, you still have traffic problems, mm -hmm. you have mitigation issues, uh, and the Charlestown situation is, is even worse, I think, right. in some cases, because, um, you know, that is, you know, actually, they're both the probably, they're probably both semi. Yep. Yep. Well, uh, Marty, again, uh, Thanks, our congratulations. We appreciate you coming by and joining us. Uh, you know, you've got uh, a full plate in front of you here, and uh, will you come back? Uh, I absolutely will. Uh, I look forward to it. Well, Thank you for having me tonight. I'd love to come back and, and give you uh, another state of the city type of yeah, mini addresses wow. as, as we move forward. We're, we're hoping to uh, cover some of that as well. And uh, again, our congratulations. Thank you, my friend. Great job. Great campaign. Thank you. When we return with more of Talk to the Neighborhoods, well, we'll have with us the, the man who's uh, helping to chronicle the rise of uh, Marty Walsh and his uh, mayoralty. He is the managing editor of the reporter newspaper chain, the Dorchester Reporter, and uh, Bill Forey joins us. Stay All right, we're back with Talking in the Neighborhoods. I'm Joe Heisler, your host. Tonight, a two-part show, but all politics and all Dorchester politics as well, to a certain degree at least. Uh, uh, joining me this half hour, man who is the uh, uh, editorial leader of the Dorchester News, Dorchester uh, reporter, newspapers, and an old friend as well. Uh, he is uh, Bill Forey joins us. Nice to have you here. Joe, it's a pleasure to be back. Thanks nice for having me. Nice to see you here. 
Well, I, I you know, it's a, a, maybe a little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, it's not too far off when I say, uh, you know, that the uh, the center of Boston's political universe has has changed. We've been so accustomed yeah. to thinking Hyde Park and certainly Southwest Boston. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the star has risen in the east, and uh, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, and you find yourself right, uh, the, the guy that's been covering it all along. And uh, now, what do you do? How do you, uh, how do you take this? And of course, you've known uh, Marty Walsh yeah. for a long time, yeah. and uh, he's, you know, of course, a Dorchester State rep covered mm -hmm. him. Uh, uh, how does uh, your company? How does the Dorchester Reporter now cover a story like this? Wow. Well, there's a lot in that, those questions. I'll, I'll try to unpack them one by one. So first, we have covered Marty since his, um, really since before his political career started, because he was a civic activist, like many political leaders. Uh, he got his start uh, as the president of the Columbia Savin Hill Civic Association back in the mid-90s. I remember then, when he ran. Yes, and Jim Brett, when Jim Brett left, obviously, and, and we now know the history of that. But we, we definitely covered uh, Marty's first campaign in 1997. I personally covered it then. Uh, um, and, and watched his first press conference ever, and uh, very, very much a fresh face. He, he, as young He's as he little, looks now, he was, I was. We were talking before. I said, you know, uh, I hate to tell you this, Marty, but you were a little green. He goes, I <laughs> he know was I green. was green. You know, he was green, and they were all green in that election. And, they and were. he stood out. Martha Coakley was green in that election. Right. That was her first run for political office, and Marty um, had the benefit in that particular special of being coming out of Savin Hill, out of Ward 13, alone. Um, as the as the uh, candidate from that part of the district, and, and really that was a huge advantage, along with labor, which of course then was also in his corner, um, and and ever since really never never really had a serious opponent. Um, in in most cases, he had no opponent. So um, Walsh uh, Marty really was under the radar screen in, in city electoral politics because of his own his own secure seat, and people didn't know. Uh, how potent his right. political a organization was. A little sliver of, uh, of Dorchester running all the way along. But he, was, uh, he, was, he was clearly behind the scenes in many other people's races, from Stephen Lynch to, mo more recently, to uh, Elizabeth Warren's successful victory. He was instrumental in the city of Boston in that. Uh, so people who were close observers were aware of Marty's per personal skills and also organizational skills. But really, um, the, the, the general public did, wouldn't have seen that tested in a, uh, right. an election when he's on the ballot. Um, it was one of those things that I think worked to his advantage in the cycle that he was a bit of a sleeper. Uh, and pe I think people initially in, a little in the little underestimated. Well, yeah, a little bit. And even though he had, you know, he was always top tier, um, people just weren't sure how he would perform elsewhere in the city. And of course, as we saw, he performed very well, even in West Roxbury, which of course John Conley won right. handily. But Marty was right there and uh, was 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 winning. You know, was not going to win a precinct there, but was going to be more competitive than perhaps John Conley could be in Dorchester. So um, there's a, there's a lot to that uh, to, to the why about how how did Marty um, make that happen? But to get back to your earlier point, um, his his star has been rising for these years because he's helped so many other people right. in their political careers. And th that's an essential part to building um, a successful citywide candidacy. A lot of people would go back to the question of shouldn't you have a citywide profile? Shouldn't you be an at-large city councilor? Isn't that the best formula to get there? Uh, and I think people like Marty Walsh said no. The, the formula is to have a very strong base, which he does, both in, the, in, his, in his district but with labor, and then to build upon that with making mm -hmm. um, smart and strategic coalitions throughout his career. And he did that. What what did you say? And you followed the obviously the race very closely. Uh, kind of the turning point. Of course, he. You know, I, I guess we shouldn't have been surprised. He he finished first in the prelim. Yeah. Yet, uh, you know, he continued to be thought of as somehow almost running from behind or right. or an underdog. And, yeah, uh, and I maybe think, that's too strong. No, I think I think people did early on say, well, yeah, he he surged that day. He had the strongest organization that day. And that was kind of a, uh, maybe a backhanded compliment that you know he was really good because labor was able to concentrate their efforts behind him. Um, but again, it gets back to that idea of he wasn't he didn't have a citywide footprint, so there was no way to map out how he would do in Roxbury, how he would do in Mattapan, how he would do in, in Hyde Park, and um, those were in, in other parts of the city, of course, as well. So 
to be fair to the punditry that went uh, went kind of whole hog around the Conley idea that he would be the favorite, I think you know that's understandable. Um, but what they were kind of missing were those intangible resources that Marty was able to deploy. Uh, of course, the coalition that he built with mm -hmm. uh, communities of color and uh, their leadership uh, how was critical. were those endorsements to that in your mind? They were essential. They were the whole ball game uh, in some respects because it shifted the momentum. It totally changed the narrative of the election. Um, the image of John, of, uh, John Barros, Felix Arroyo, Charlotte Gola Ritchie, the three of them walking with Marty Walsh. That photo was uh, very strong. Very it's like, I think it's the the iconic photo yeah. of the election right. at this uh, at this stage, and um, so it 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 just it would just undercut John Conley's um, momentum tremendously, and it and it just served as a um, uh, as a message to communities of color that this is this is somebody that we should give another look to if we haven't before, and of course. Um, I think in, in many respects, if had there been a person of color in the final, it would have been a different story. Right. But, um, but Walsh was able to build on, on those, um, those endorsements and, uh, and then employ his own. And, and one of the other elements to that um, coalition is SCIU 1199, which has a, has a very tenacious and, and impressive ground game in communities of color. Mm -hmm. So that uh, one-two punch, I think, was, was really devastating. Well, uh, and of course, uh, last week we had on uh, uh, Reverend Minyard Culpepper, and uh, he and the Urban League of Eastern Mass, the NAACP, uh, uh, formed this, uh, they called Boston uh, mm -hmm. uh, Inclusion Alliance. Is there, is, can, and of course, it's a tall task, you know, there were a lot of promises made, and I asked Marty when he was here. And he said it won't happen overnight, but uh, uh, he promised or suggested that uh, you, know, you know, basically half of the workforce, half of mm -hmm. the opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, would go to the community of color. Is that doable in your mind, Bill? Yeah, it is doable. Um, the political will has got to be there, and um, there's no question that the um, the talent is there. There's no question that the uh, the people themselves are there, and they live in the city. Um, and it's always been the case, at least in the last 20 years, that the demographics would support such a, a, a shift in the workforce. But it hasn't followed. And I think um, part of uh, part of Marty Walsh's appeal um, to leaders of color and, and decision makers who went with him was that Marty has the capacity to be influential, not only in City Hall, not only with city jobs and city appointments, but with the trade unions and with being a decisive voice in, within that movement, because he's a national labor leader now. Yeah. To be a decisive uh, voice of, uh, you know, of, of saying point blank to labor leaders that not only must we uh, diversify the rank and file uh, the, at, the, at the apprentice level, we must diversify within the leadership level. We must have business agents and executive boards that reflect the city. And really, there's no one else who was on the ballot in the cycle who could have had that sort of promise right. behind his candidacy. If he, if he doesn't deliver on it, Marty Walsh will have difficulty getting reelected. Right. And that's just point blank. As, as, um, that's the as, flip side of that. The flip uh, side of it. But, but he, as, as, mm -hmm. as we've discussed off air, I mean, he's a very likable person, and he's somebody that people want to uh, see him succeed. He has that uh, innate quality about him, but he's also a very shrewd political mind, and he, he understands full well that dynamic that he must deliver on on not not necessarily promises, but on the reality that the expectation is there that he deliver, um, and so I think he will. Tough business uh, being mayor, you know. Uh, Got to say no, mm -hmm. probably more than you might want, and you know, especially. Uh, depending upon the economy, the kind of revenue you have, that type of thing. Uh, uh, Marty is such a likable guy. Yep. And, uh, you know, kind of unassuming. I mean, that's part of his appeal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, people genuinely like him. Uh, is the mayor's uh, office likely to change him? I think so. Yeah, I don't see how it couldn't. I mean, it's a different dynamic than the state legislature. It's a it's a different set of expectations mm -hmm. and demands, and and as you said, uh, uh, actually having to take some pretty tough decisions and put them right on people 
who have been supportive of you for your whole pol political career and to have to tell them no or to have to tell them not only no but no way and you're going down the wrong road. It's a tough, tough and tall order for somebody who's oftentimes in, in a legislative sense had uh, been able to find a way around no. Right. And, and that's part kind of Kind of a collegial right. atmosphere also as well. It's a little bit different. No question. Um, and it is, there is that, that hint of, um, you know, he wants the council to have more power. He wants the city council to, to there to be a different tone perhaps between the council and the mayor. And I think that's sincere. Um, however, I do think too that it, it'll change over time. Um, not to say that, that he's... Don't you get elbowed a couple of times. Right. <laughs> and, but not to say he's wrong-headed in that. I think that's the right way to approach the beginning. Yeah. But um, the realities of the office, I think, will, be, will, will change him as they would anybody. Did the city council take him off the hook by uh, approving that uh, police arbitration award? I'd be, he would have been, you know, under a lot of pressure. Here's the uh, guy that was portrayed as the... Uh, the union stooge, for yeah. uh, lack of a better term, and uh, yeah, no, I'm not I saying it was fair, but you know, yeah. that was uh, pretty tough stuff. You know, it is, and it's it, it did take him off the hook in a way, um, but it also sets up the next. You know, it's not going to get any easier, and the next round of negotiations will no doubt include him, and he'll have to be the one holding the, holding the line. Well, will that add some pressure on him? And I was mm -hmm. I asked him about this, and he. he, he I won't say he ducked it because he believes that he could get all sides to the table, but uh, under yeah. some pressure to be tougher yeah. in negotiations than you know he might have been before because of that. Yeah, I yes, I think that's true. But it's also the case that in past negotiations he has been the person to be able to take labor aside, perhaps, or at the table and and speak bluntly and speak um, convincingly. I will say as one of their own to say, look. Um, We've got I don't think that's here. really been tried either. Yeah, it's a different model for the for the mayor's uh, job, and it's uh, it's certainly something that is is untested a bit. But I think there's there's, there's a certain um, you know intellect and, and and understanding among the electorate that that's that's not a bad model. That somebody who does have the leverage within labor to be able to to speak to them bluntly or perhaps um, with, with with you know speak their language so to speak, isn't a perhaps. Uh, may be preferable to the sort of um, constant um, s stalemate that could follow a, a mayor whose position is more of a you know contentious or confrontational. Um, it'll it's a style difference that that we haven't seen lately among uh, in, in municipal life here in Boston. I think it's something that people are, wor are willing to try, uh, and if it doesn't work, I think that they would re revisit it. And so it is well, pressure on Marty Walsh kind of to make come that back. happen. Personalities aside, uh, what did you see this election, the kinds of changes it's, it's, it's potentially will bring? Uh, you know, I talked about the, uh, at the top of the show, the uh, center of the political universe uh, uh, moving, but you know, in more ways than one, not just geographically. Uh, right. how, how, how do you see, and you, been following, covering the city in, in depth for, for so long. How do you see uh, these changes? Well, you know, th th there'll be there'll, there'll be change again in the style and, and I think in the dynamic of how of how Marty approaches um, working with other elected officials and maybe be, be initially at least more inclusive and more co uh, cooperative in in trying to put them out there as well and try to um, to give them a chance to shine with their ideas. I think that is his style. He's a little bit more collaborative by nature. Make them look good too. Yeah, make them look good. Um, I think he will be somebody who looks for ways to um, to to diversify his his own his own personal circle in addition to the cabinet. I think he's going to try to bring in young leaders of color for instance into his personal circle. Um, that's something that may be a little bit different too. Um, it's one thing to appoint somebody to a cabinet level position. It's another to have a relationship with them offline, you know. And I think Marty's of an age group where he does have that capacity. Um, so the big thing I think everybody um, kind of You're among the about swing that, that voters, Felix Arroyo types, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, you know, John Barrows, Charlotte Ritchie, yeah. people like that, uh, and even even other you people. You expect who them were, to land in the administration. Um, I expect maybe one of those three at least to land in the administration, and others will, will have influence, be, you know, beyond that. Uh, but certainly, I do expect that his cabinet will will certainly uh, be 
as diverse as uh, as he hints that it will be. And I think that the leadership he's put into the transition team is a signal of that as well. And that uh, people, young young leaders of, of color, people like Mariana White Hammond and, and people who are um, who have been who were kind of critical at, at certain stages of that endorsement phase for Marty, um, not only elected, but there was a coalition of, of young leaders of color who came out for him. Um, people from that group, I think, are going to populate quite heavily his his they have in his transition team, and I think you'll see many of those folks in the administration as well. So that will that will be a difference. He'll need to be. Um, uh, careful in in how he plays his hand as a political leader in you know district council races, state rep races, mm -hmm. etc., and um, and to be you know to pick his battles. And he has in the past. He's as I said, he could be a shrewd um, political mind. Well, we're so staying accustomed out of races to, to Menino being you know the 800 pound gorilla, whether he endorsed or right. not. You know his machine. Are we likely to see that same kind of machine? Uh, Yes, Pop. but again, and again, it'll come back to where, when he decides to use it in picking his battles. And obviously, in the statewide races where where um, the mayor of Boston can, can and, and has delivered for candidates, people like Elizabeth Warren, and going back further to to other earlier races. But there's also a danger of being diminished by not delivering. And so I think um, there'll be some early tests for Mayor Walsh uh, next year, the gubernatorial election, the primary, the Democratic sure. primary. I'm sure. Uh, people will be waiting to see who he gets behind, and it will it'll be an early test of his uh, political power and whether it's transferable. It certainly was for Mayor Menino for a phase, and then I think that was diminished towards the latter right. part of his uh, last term, and we saw places where he didn't have um, the capacity to deliver. And that may have been a little bit of an early warning that um, his his political potency was right. Past its was, prime. Uh, all right, now we go back to the first question. How do you cover? Yeah, uh, this uh, put you in a different uh, spot. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, not that uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, criticism, but you know, uh, to look with a critical eye right. uh, as his administration develops. Uh, you know, a, a, a good Dorchester boy, and not that mm -hmm. you haven't always been able to keep it separate. I know you have. You're well, it starts. Real pro. Thank you I, for that. Uh, it starts with you know hiring good people to do that coverage uh, along with me, and so uh, Gid Dumptious is our news editor. He does an excellent job. He covers city politics really like no other at the moment, and some of and the best stuff done. He's obsessive say. about it in a way that that you kind of need. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's having somebody like Ginn kind of on the front lines for us, um, not only in our paper but on social media, really driving uh, stories is, is essential. It's also critical to have back support like Tom Mulvoy, who's our associate editor. Um, so we, we have the right team in place, but you're right, there, there, there are judgments that have to be made and there, there will be critiques made of, of his administration that will be applied just as we would if it was John Conley in office. And, and we've already, frankly, um, had some had an opportunity to critique a, a Walsh, an early Walsh decision that we didn't care for, and um, I think he knows uh, from from our coverage of his legislative career that we will uh, on occasion differ, yeah. and we will speak up about it, and it's nothing personal. Yeah. It's part of what not we do. Not part of what punch. We, absolutely not, but but we'll do it respectfully, yeah. and we, we're not looking to do gotcha stuff, but where the, when there when there are issues that arise, it's going to going to be in the paper, and uh, I think. Um, you know, Mayor-elect Walsh respects that, and and we we did not make an endorsement in the preliminary election. Uh, we had six candidates of the twelve who were from our mm -hmm. neighborhood, and uh, several of them were quite good, and we thought would be potential uh, finalists. Um, and we did endorse. We were one of two papers that endorsed Marty Walsh in the final. Um, the other was the Weekly Dig. So the rest of Boston's establishment media really <laughs> went somewhere else so with you're their decision. So unique in more ways than one. If you don't read the Dorchester News and, and your other affiliated publications, yeah. you, you still have the Haitian Reporter? Yeah, we do the, the, all the report. They're all called the Reporter, Dorchester, Mattapan, Haitian, and right. Irish. Yep. And then we our online site for Dorchester is called dotnews.com. So right. you know, everybody across the city, is well. You know, we invite them to read us there. I, I have to say some of the best coverage of the uh, election, the mayoral election, <laughs> the council elections, and... Uh, uh, joining me in this half hour has been uh, Bill Forey, the uh, managing editor of uh, uh, reporters, newspapers, including the uh, Dorchester Reporter. Bill, as always, I enjoy uh, Thanks, having you here, talking some politics. Nice to Thanks, see buddy. you. Goes fast. Uh, Thanks Merry for the Christmas. time. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Same I to you. See you.
Uh, you're watching Talk to the Neighbors here on the Boston Neighborhood Network. We're here tonight and every Monday night at the same time. We'll be back next week. Until then, for the entire staff and crew here at BNN, thank you for watching. Have a pleasant evening. Good night.